And so today we're talking about stepping into the flow. Next week we'll talk about trusting the flow. But today we're stepping into it. What does it take to step into it, to consciously step into it? And I think it takes something that, some things that we're used to hearing about around here. But the first thing it takes is exactly what Laura just sang about. A lot of times when we feel a lack in our lives, we think if I could just get something and bring it to me, if I could just get more time in the day, if I could just get someone to love me, if I could just get someone to see me and see how talented and skilled I am, if I could just get more money, if I could just get more support, everything would be fine. And what an illusion that is because the truth is when the, the infinite nature of life is providing all that good for us and we are accountable to open up our awareness to be in receivership of it, it's really more about letting go, isn't it? So her song, first assignment for us all this week is the mantra, I think it's time for the letting go. I think it's time for the letting go. I think it's time for the letting go. It's time for the letting go of ideas and concepts and, and things that no longer serve us, blocks to our awareness. And I love what Alan Cohen, the great author and speaker and teacher says, he says, I leave claw marks and everything I'm asked to let go of. <laughs> and I like that because we cling, don't we, to our mental equivalents. We cling to our ideas. We cling to our worry. If someone says, oh, I don't know if you need to worry about that, we will argue with them about why we need to worry about that, right? We cling and we have a hard time sometimes really letting go. Sometimes it's because cherished beings in our life who were around us taking care of us told us things that aren't true. So the first thing I'm inviting us to let go of is blocking habits, habits of mind, habits of activity, habits of worry, habits of not setting good boundaries and letting people take advantage of us, habits of spending time and money and energy in things that no longer serve us. And my mother, Linda Frizee, who is a motivational speaker, she has a, a private practice where she's done counseling and teaches the Enneagram, has told in some of her speaking a story that has impacted me over the years that I've told in financial uh, abundance classes. A true story about a young girl who went to an amusement park with her grandmother. And her grandmother was often a little worried about money a lot of times. And she gave the little girl a $20 bill and told the, her granddaughter, you can spend this any way you want today. So the little girl put the $20 in her pocket and she wisely decided she would move through the amusement park and throughout the day look at the options of things she could buy and at the end of the day she'd buy what she wanted. So at the end of the day she'd found what she wanted. She and grandma go to the store to purchase it and when the little girl reached inside her pocket after going on all those rides her 20 bill was gone. She started crying because she knew she'd lost it. And her grandmother, who, as I said, worried all the time about money, gave her her first lesson by saying to her, you stupid girl, you should have spent it sooner. <laughs> now imagine this young woman grows up. She can attract money. Money comes to her easily. But can she keep it? No. She spends it as fast as she gets it. And she comes to someone like my mother to say, I don't understand. I don't understand why I can't hang on to money. I don't understand why I can't save it. I don't understand why it does. It comes, but it never stays. And so working with someone like my mother, she discovers this memory of this story of this key moment in her life where her grandmother, I'm sure, was thinking she was be, being loving and kind to teach her a lesson about money, but it was a lesson in lack, unfortunately. So this woman had to undo that lesson. She had to look at the habits she had of thinking, the habits of approach she had, so that she could change that experience and shift into new habits. Indeed, all of the research that I found said that we can't just let go of bad habits, we have to replace them with new habits. We have to find new ways to approach life, new ways of thinking, new ways of speaking, new ways of being. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, says you should forever increase this receptivity when he's talking about the flow of life. 
continuously extending and expanding your comprehension. So here's a good habit for us to get into practice. He says, declare a hundred times a day, good and more good is mine. Good and more good is mine. There is no limit to the good that is mine. Everywhere I go, I see this good. I feel it. I experience it. It presses itself against me, flows through me, expresses itself in me, and multiplies itself around me. It's about affirming, claiming a new thought, a new idea for ourselves, which is very related to my next one, which is bold intention. So it's, it's getting rid of habits that block us from that good and then having bold intention. As I teach classes here, one of my favorite classes to teach is our Prosperity Plus class. In it, we focus on the work of Mary Morrissey and watch videos from Mary and learn prosperity principles that are often appear at first to be related to financial abundance. But really, here's where we start. We start at looking at intention in four specific areas of life. We look at intention in uh, health and well-being. We look at our intentions in love and relationships. We look at our intentions around our vocation and we look at our intentions around time and money. And we cast a big vision. And then we talk about not only casting that vision, but then being present to that vision every day, being willing to presence ourselves and bring us back to that intention because intention creates a container for us. Intention is one of the most powerful openings of that aperture that we've ever seen. And I love teaching it and participating in it and watching as students do that holy sacred work along with the uplift, honestly, of being generous, of practicing tithing and serving and giving time and money out to the world and feeling all of that uplift that lifts up our intentions and helps us feel that sense of joy and abundance, it has transformed lives. And shameless plug, I will be teaching that class in June, on June 7th. So uh, if you'd like to join me for it, please do. And this is part of why I love it, the power of intention for us individually and collectively cannot be talk, talked of or spoken of enough. Indeed, as you came in today, you were handed a card. We call this our giving intention card and it's a part of our, our yearly tradition for our fiscal year, which begins July 1st. We invite those in our community who feel as though this is their church and they want to continue to feed it with their abundance to fill out this card. And we ask you today to take this card or if you feel ready to fill it out today and leave it, there are containers in the lobby, but at the, take it and put it on your, your altar, pray over it, think about it. I want to call out though that this card is not just for our church. I say, firstly, this card is a bold intention for any of us who fill it out. Because what we are saying when we fill it out is I intend to be a place where good flows. I intend to be a place where financial abundance flows. And out of that flow, I intend to be someone who shares at least a little bit of that with my church. I intend to be in the flow of receivership. So by filling out the card, I am saying yes to the infinite flow that flows through me. And by turning it in and sharing with the church and the board what we're planning to do, we're saying yes to being a, a place where we're giving out. And that receivership and giving completes the cycle of abundance and makes us even more available to the good that God is that flows through us. Wise Alan Cohen also says to us, do not wait until the conditions are perfect to begin. He says, beginning makes the conditions perfect. So this is our invitation for anyone who feels called to allow those conditions to be perfect, begin to begin for themselves. Those of you online or anyone here can go to our website and fill out the card there if you would like. It's totally up to you and we ask you with love and joy, we'll be asking in the next few weeks for everyone to consider an opportunity to join us. And then the second part is not only does it support us individually, we set an intention for our church. 
We set an intention for our church to continue to thrive. We set an intention for our belonging and as, as Josh said, our ownership of this church, our partnership with Josh and me to continue to see this church thrive for ourselves and all others who come after us in the next year. So it's an opportunity to use the power of intention powerfully and consciously. And the last one is blessed forgiveness, forgivingness. So when I first started hearing the great masters in my lifetime, Edwin Gaines and Mary Morrissey talk about specifically financial abundance and forgiveness, I will admit I didn't get it. I thought, what the heck does forgiveness have to do with how much money I have? I don't get it. But I trusted them. And I also heard that song that Laura sang for the first time right about that same time. And there's a line in that song that really got me. For the sake of the rest of my life, I'm willing to surrender it all. The guilt and the fear, the anger, the tears, the resentment, those things she sang, and that hit me. And I thought, you know what? For the sake of the rest of my life, how am I harming myself by continuing to hang on to my anger and resentment and frustration? And so I began a conscious process of forgiving my abusers, of forgiving the people who'd betrayed me, who'd hurt me, who'd, who'd made fun of me, who'd broken my heart. I began to consciously forgive and I, I admit that the minute I started doing that, my life began to expand in ways I could never have imagined, including financially. And I believe that that is because when we are in anger, judgment, resentment, that aperture is very small. It's harder for that light that we are to get through. Doesn't change the nature of the light at all. Just like closing the shades at your house doesn't change the nature of the sun at all. But being in resentment and anger and fear is like closing the shades of my own soul, of my, of my energy, of the, the truth that seeks to be expressed through me as I remain steadfast to unforgiveness, as I remain steadfast to the stories of what's been done to me versus the story of who I really am. Forgiveness invites me into who I really am. And the minute that I started that, life changed. The great Matt Kahn, who's coming here on June 3rd, says, every adversity in your life will come to an end the moment you stop blaming yourself or anyone for it. And that's what I've experienced. A huge part of abundance is being willing to let go of pain and unforgiveness and resentment and anger and judgment and begin instead to embrace love and peace and wholeness. The, the wisest beings throughout the ages have been telling us this. Jesus used to say to his, his, his followers to, give, to forgive 70 times seven. One of the things that I did was for seven days, I forgave 70 times. Writing, I forgive, and I had quite a few names that I had to do this with, and it took me some time, but I did it. And now, I am free. I am free of those resentments. I am free of that pain. I am free of that story. Now those stories are things that occurred, but they don't charge me, they don't light me up, they don't keep me from who I really am. That's an important thing for us to practice. I'm fortunate that I get to teach in our ministerial school here at Mile High Church. And this past few weeks, I was teaching our uh, ministers about speaking. And I make them all come and bring stories and, and uh, humorous stories and inspirational stories that they can tell. And it really serves them in growing their skills and it serves me in stealing, I mean, borrowing lots of good <laughs> material. And one of our students named Jean Lean brought a beautiful story that I remember from a long time ago about another Jean named Jean Harper. In 1959, Jean Harper was in the third grade. Her teacher asked all of the class to write what they wanted to be when they grew up. Jean was living in Northern California at the time and her father was an uh, airline pilot, a uh, crop duster. 
she loved planes and she loved everything about flying. And so she wrote to her third grade teacher that she had plans to be an airline pilot, crop duster, jump out of the parachute and to be a, a commercial airline pilot. She turned it in and the next day her teacher came and put the paper down, face down on her desk with a big old F on it and said, that is a fairy tale. Girls cannot fly planes. Well, Jean was humiliated and sad and she went home and she told her father about this and her father said, oh, that teacher doesn't know what she's talking about. Look at Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart was a pilot. And that kind of uh, cheered her up a little bit, but she, she went through her young life sort of sharing her plans every once in a while in the 60s and people just would bat her down. That's not going to happen. Girls can't fly planes. Who do you think you are? That's never going to occur. You need something else. And so when she got to high school, in her last year in high school, her English teacher was Mrs. Doris Slayton. And Doris asked the kids to write an essay about 10 years from now, where do you see yourself? And Jean thought, oh, that dream of being a pilot. But she said, no, I, I can't do that. And she thought, well, maybe I could be a flight attendant, but I'm not pretty enough. Maybe I'll just get married. And then she said, oh, yeah, but what guy would want me? And then she said, you know, 10 years from now, I could be a waitress. I could do that. And so her dream, is, while, while being a waitress is a great thing to do, great service, that wasn't her dream, but she picked that dream instead. And she turned it into the teacher. A few weeks later, the teacher came, and just like her third grade teacher, plopped it down on the desk, but there was no grade. And she said to the class, okay, everyone, now on this side of the paper, here's what I want you to do. Take a moment and imagine that you had limitless skills and abilities, access to the best schools, any training you could ever want, access to any money, financial support you could ever need, and that the way was made for you. What would you do then? This excited Jean. So she wrote again about her dreams of being a pilot, enthusiastically. And the teacher, Mrs. Slayton, after they were all done writing, leaned forward on her desk and she said, okay class, I'm gonna tell you a secret. You do have limitless abilities and talents. You do have access to education. You do have access to financial abundance if you're willing to work for it. You can make any dream you want come true but you're going to have to make it happen. You're going to have to pursue your dreams. And this touched Jean deeply. She went up to the teacher afterwards and she shared her dream and the teacher said, well, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. This turned Jean's life around. And she did do everything that was in that fairy tale in third grade. Jean Harper uh, did do hundreds of parachute jumps. She did fly crop duster flights. She did even seed clouds. She did become a pilot. It took her 10 years of hard work. And at first it was mostly in smaller air aircraft as a co-pilot. And she still had to endure every once in a while that pushback from people in her industry who said she couldn't do it because she was a girl, that sort of thing. But in 1978, United Airlines brought her on with three other women to become the first commercial airline pilots with their, with their airline. And that was in the midst of, the, of our U.S. allowing 50 women to become commercial pilots. So she became a commercial pilot and she retired in 2013. And in 2013, she flew her, was, I get the 737, was it? I think it is. I always get the aircraft messed up and my husband be upset because he likes me. He likes me. Here's a photo of Jean, by the way, in her cockpit flying. She says, I chose to believe my teacher. And she rolled up for her last flight in her 757 to the gate of her hometown, her new hometown, Denver, at Denver International Air Airport. And there was a, two fire trucks there with the water going and she got to walk underneath that archway as everyone at the airport and United Airlines celebrated this beautiful accomplishment of Jean Harper. I think this is a powerful story, yes, yes. And today as I complete this message, I want to represent Mrs. Slater and look at us all and say to us, we know, we know about the infinite flow. And we have access to all the gifts and talents we could ever need to live the life we would like to live. 
We have access to all the resources that are necessary to live the life we need to live. We just have to get about choosing it and saying yes to it. During this program, this week, I invite you, all of us, to let go of our habits, uh, to set new intentions, to do our forgiveness work, to let go and to recognize that whatever is necessary is available in this universe through that flow for us to create dreams, to live our life, to step forward in beautiful and bold ways. And with that, let us pray. I invite our practitioner prayer partners to join me if they choose to in this prayer by standing. And as they take that stand, we take a stand together to recognize the infinite light and love that God is everywhere present, shining brightly, boldly, and powerfully in through and as all creation. We breathe it in right here and right now, just as we breathe in the sunlight, even though we're indoors and we can't technically see that sun shining, but we know that that light is here in this room and we breathe it in. And we know that even though in our life right now, we may not as easily see the the presence of God. We recognize that it is here and we breathe it in and we take it in and it flows into us, through us and as us. And it inspires and uplifts us. And we feel that guidance and that call and that voice within us that says, oh, my beloved one, yes, live, live that life that is calling that is calling. This is a life of abundance. There is more than enough good. There is more than enough God. There is more than enough for any dream or desire that we choose to step into. And so we feel that holy, sacred, yes, calling to us, beckoning us forward into our life beyond this beautiful community, walking in a pathway of infinite abundance, choosing consciously this day to step into the flow. I accept and affirm this for each one of us now as I give thanks that I, this is so. I know this, affirm this, and shall continue to affirm this throughout these four weeks for every single one of us, accepting passionately the truth of who we are. I let go, I let God, and I simply let it be. And so it is. Amen.